Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading. 1 Corinthians 13, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 13 verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll read them responsibly. I'll, we'll begin together on verse number 1, then I'll read 2, together on 3. We'll alternate like that until we end together on verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And as our custom is, let's stand together. To read the scripture, all of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 13. Ready? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of this passage of Scripture today. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring men of old, the words that they would write on paper, and then, Lord, preserving those words that we have copies of it today in our hand. Lord, I pray that each of us would receive the word today, not as the words of men or the words of a man, but as they are in truth, the words of God. And they would work effectually in each one of us that believe. Lord, we pray that you'll prepare our hearts, that our hearts will be good soil, that the word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. Bless the special now this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I want my life to be a light for those around me. I want my life to be that road map that says hope. I want my life to be a beacon on life's raging sea. I want the world to see Jesus when they look at me. When When the the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? 
When the world looks at me, what do they see? Do they see hope? Do they see love? Do they see charity? When the world looks at me, what will they see? When I spoke, did my words contain your wisdom, Lord? And when I prayed, did my prayers contain your love? And did my life reflect the glory of your spirit? And did I show the ones around me they were loved? When, when the, the world, world looks at, at me, me, do they see Jesus? When the world looks at me, what do they see? Do they see hope? Do they see love? Do they see charity? When the world looks at me, what do they see? When the world looks at you, do they see Jesus? When the world looks at you, what do they see? Do they see hope? Do they see love? Do they see charity? When the world looks at you, what do they see? When the world looks at me, what do they see? Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And, Father, I'm asking for your help now as we open your word this morning. Lord, I'm asking that you would help me to say what I ought to say today and leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. Lord, I'm praying that you'll help each one listening today to <clears throat> listen carefully and to focus and to concentrate that we'd not miss the still, small voice of the Spirit of God as He speaks to us through Your Word. Pray that You would challenge each of us this morning with the truth that we bring today, with the truth that they just sang about in the song, that others would see Christ in us. Father, help me as I bring the message and help the people as they listen this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. As a uh, young man in Bible college, I, I rephrase that, as a younger man in Bible college, um, <laughs> I read a book called In His Steps. Anybody ever read that book? In His Steps. Um, it, it, it was a congregation that the pastor challenged his congregation that they would, for one year, uh, not do anything or say anything or any, any of their affairs of life uh, doing anything, business, personal, otherwise, without first asking the question, what would Jesus do? And it, 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 the book is basically following several different individuals uh, through their course of that year and what impact that had in their life, uh, what a difference it made for them. I'm not endorsing necessarily the book or the theology of the book or the author even. I just thought that's an interesting concept, and it certainly... It impacted me. It's much like the song they just sang. When the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? What do they see? Do they see hope? Do they see love? Do they see charity? When the world looks at me, when the world looks at you, what do they see? The church at Corinth was a pretty troubled church. And the reason they were troubled was they were fleshly. They're <clears throat> they're, they were living under the control of their soul. You know what your soul is? Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. That is what I think, what I feel, and what I want. When someone is lost, they're living totally under the control of their soul. Before you came to know Christ, your life was basically whatever you thought, whatever you wanted, whatever you wanted, to, whatever you felt like doing. Uh, that was that was that's how you live. 
But you find out once you're saved and the Spirit of God comes in and your spirit is brought to life, then your, the, our spirit bears witness with His Spirit and His Spirit tells us the things of God. And now, no longer is, is my soul in control, what I think, what I feel, and what I want, but His Spirit's to be in control. And my spirit yields to His Spirit and my body then and my soul yield to my spirit. The Corinth was not like that. They were still living under the control of the Spirit. They were carnal. The Bible calls them fleshly. They were, they were very proud. They were puffed up. That's why they were taking one another to court. That's why they, they, were, they were having divisions over who had their favorite preacher. I like Peter, and I like Paul, and I like Apollos, and they were having uh, fights and schisms, uh, divisions over that in the church. Uh, they had people who were getting very proud of being able to speak in an unknown tongue, uh, get up and speak in gibberish that nobody knew what they were talking about, and everybody's saying, ooh, wow, that's impressive. And, and when they got together, they found out that those people got recognized, so then they come together, and you know what? Everybody had a tongue. Everybody had something to say. Everybody wanted the spotlight. And that, that's what brought Paul to 1 Corinthians 13. When, when, he, when he said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Hey, it doesn't matter how great I can talk. He's saying, if I don't have charity, then I'm just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I'm, it's nothing. The next couple verses, he talks about, doesn't matter how much faith you have, doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, doesn't matter whether you think you have the gift of prophecy, if you don't have charity, you are what? Nothing. Nothing. Now, I want you to understand something. The word in 1 Corinthians 13 is charity. Uh, there's a, how many understand the word love is all through the Bible, right? I love not the world, neither things of the world. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is the love of God. God so loved the world. But he didn't use the word love in 1 Corinthians 13. He used the word charity. And, and charity, uh, by, by definition now, it's, uh, we've, we've, you know, you understand many words have changed from Bible usage to how we use them today. And charity is one of those. Now, nowadays, when you mention charity to somebody, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah, just helping the poor, right? Giving someone, giving, giving to this organization, I mean, just helping somebody out, that's just charity, okay? Uh, but it had a broader meaning than that uh, in the Bible. Here's Here's what Webster's 1828 says. Charity is benevolence. It's goodwill. It's the, the disposition of heart which inclines me to think favorably of my fellow man to think uh, and, and to do them good. So and what, if I could boil it down to something you could work with, I think charity is this. Loving others as God loves me. It's me loving others as God has loved me. And so that same way that God loves me is what I want to pass on to other people. And that's charity. Now, I believe, and this is something interesting, you ought to, I, I believe the perfect example, what, what gives us the, the perfect encapsulation, if you will, the perfect view of what charity is, is Jesus Christ. In fact, it's really, it's really great to look at 1 Corinthians 13, and every time you see the word charity, Read the word Jesus. Would you do that? Let's look at it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not Jesus, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not Jesus, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not it profiteth me nothing. Jesus suffers long and is kind. Jesus envieth not. Jesus vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave himself unseemly, seeketh not his own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Jesus never faileth. Jesus never fails. Isn't that good? So I see Jesus is 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus is charity. If, I'm gonna, if I would just live 1 Corinthians 13 
Others would see Jesus in me. Others would see Jesus in you. And we would see what the world, the world would get to see what he looks at. What he's saying here is, the world's not, listen, the world doesn't need more great benefactors. The world doesn't need more great orators. The world doesn't need more, more great preachers, so to speak, or more great singers. It certainly doesn't need more great social programs. What the world needs is Jesus Christ. And what the world needs to see is Jesus Christ in you and in me. That's what it needs to happen. And by the way, that's God's will. God's will that each of us be conformed to the image of His Son. That people, that He, the things that God does in our lives, the things that He has allowed into our lives, is shaping us and molding us, what? To be like Jesus Christ. That's His goal. We're to be conformed to the image of His Son. So when I say, I want to show the world Jesus, or I want the world to see Jesus in me, what does that look like? I mean, we say, yeah, that's what I want, but how does that, how does that work out in day-to-day life? Well, that's what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us. It's not a bracelet on your wrist that says WWJD and everybody just does whatever they think. That's, that's far from the truth. Okay, It is. God gives us His Word right here and tells us what Jesus would do. You're not going to know. Listen, you're not going to have knowledge of the Son of God apart from the Word of God. You're only going to know the Son of God as you know the Word of God. If you're ignorant of the Word of God, you're ignorant of the Son of God. Okay, And and the reason a lot of people have no idea what Jesus was doing is because they have no idea what the Bible says. If you know what the Bible says, you'll know what Jesus would do. Does that make sense? So the world is looking for Jesus. And what will that look like? I think we have it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll give you several things. Let's just work our way through this. All right, starting in verse number 4, we're going to see what it looks like to have Christ seen in us. Christ is seen in me. Christ is seen in you when we, number 1, verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Number 1, He's seen in us when we suffer long and we're kind. It means you endure an injury or a or a provocation without being filled with resentment or revenge. It means I don't promptly retaliate or punish. Now most of us, as you grow older anyway, you learn that you can suffer long. The, the real challenge is the next half. Suffer long and is kind. It's a very difficult thing sometimes to suffer and be kind. I mean, if he'd have left that part off, that'd have been all right. But he didn't. He put it in there. Jesus betrayed with a kiss, falsely accused, beaten, scourged, spit upon, nailed to a cross, and he said, "Father, forgive them. They know not what they do." When you've been wronged, when you suffer. When other people have inflicted pain upon you and you forgive and you are still kind, then you are being like Jesus. Then Jesus is being seen in you. Suffering long and being kind. When the world looks at you, when your family looks at you, When your husband, when your wife looks at you, do they see Jesus? Number two. Some of you are happy to move on. Then it says, charity envieth not. The second way I see Jesus can be seen in me is when I envy not. You know what that means? Not upset because somebody else receives something. But it means more than that. It means I'm not upset when someone else receives something that I think I should have received. That's envy. How come they were asked to sing a special? How come they were asked to help? How come they got to do that? What is envy? Envy is a disgruntled dissatisfaction with your house after visiting someone else's house. 
What's envy? It's the absence of happiness for a friend who just passed you up on the ladder of success. What's envy? It's finding stones to throw at the church down the road because it's growing faster than your church. What's envy? It's hating your brother or your sister because you feel like they're your parents' favorite. What's envy? It's a resentment that you cannot sing like she can sing or you can't play the instrument like she can play the instrument or you can't, uh, you know, uh, play sports like he can play sports. You don't have the talent that that person has. You can't paint like they can paint or you can't teach like they can teach and, and pretty soon your eyes turn a, turn a green color. Envy. The Bible says, Charity envieth not. You're not envious when someone else gets something that you feel like you deserve. Okay? When the world looks at you, do they see Jesus? Hmm? Vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. The third way I see Jesus can be seen in me is when I, I, I don't vaunt myself. What it means is I don't boast of myself. I don't promote myself. Don't get two things. Don't get puffed up when other people praise you. And certainly, never think you're big and other people are little. Paul who wrote half our New Testament. Paul, who was able to see the Lord Jesus in person as one born out of due time. Paul, who was caught up to the third heaven and saw things he said, I can't even talk about. Not lawful for me to utter. Paul, Paul had an amazing, amazing life. But he never mentions those things. He never, you know, what Paul, Paul, who are you? He said, you know who I am? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's who I am. That's what Paul said, it's by the grace of God I am what I am. That, that's what Paul thought of himself. It means to manifest pride. Vaunting itself means to manifest pride, to, to manifest your self-esteem. The world says, oh, you got to have self-esteem. But the Bible says, you die to self. It's a different message, isn't it? Oh, you got to have confidence in yourself. Paul said, I put no confidence in my flesh. I trust in the Lord with all my heart. And I lean not to my own understanding. And so he understands it, that that it's, it means to, to blow, up, blow yourself up, basically, out of importance. To be proud over your position. To see yourself superior to other people. That's vaunting yourself. You know, the great person never thinks of their own importance. The great person never thinks of their own importance. Napoleon said this, I am not a man like other men. The laws nor morality do not apply to me. That's a proud man. Jesus said this, Suffer the little children to come unto me. The disciples said, Don't let those kids bother you. Huh? Don't, don't ever you be in church say, Oh, what are these kids doing? Man, those kids are so... Now, wait a minute. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me and forbid them not. So such is the kingdom of God. You'll see a phrase through the Gospels that says, the common people heard him gladly. See, Jesus never, never put himself above somebody else. Vaunteth not itself. See, that goes with the previous one of, of not being envious. 
The way you're not envious is you don't think that you deserve that. Well, I should have done that. I should have sung that. I should teach that. I should have been credited for that. What, what am I? Nothing? Yes. It's exactly what we are. We're all nothings that only God can do something with. And whatever God chooses to do something with me or you, that's what he does. And praise the Lord for that. Well, number four. It bonded not itself, is not puffed up. And then verse five, doth not behave itself unseemly. It simply means you're always appropriate. You're not out of place. You're not off color. Now, in, when, when someone says appropriate in our, in our mind, it, it, it means that I'm, I, I'm, I'm acting in a way that's acceptable with the, the community norms or the community standard. That's what's considered appropriate. But you understand, our standard of appropriateness, our standard of not being unseemly is not what the community standard is. We have a different standard, and that is the standard of God's Word. We don't march to the drum of the community or of the world. We march to the drum of the Word of God. And so somebody says, don't you know that that's out of date? No, I'm just in, in date with the Bible. Don't you know that that's not, that's not up to fashion with the world? Well, I'm not trying to be in fashion with the world. I'm trying to be right with God. And, and so you have to understand, it's the Word of God. And so I'm not... I'm going to be appropriate according to the standard of the Word of God and the standard of Jesus Christ. Uh, when, when someone behaves themselves unseemly, when they're not appropriate, and you're with them, you're embarrassed for them. Maybe for yourself. <laughs> you know, are, are you with them? Yeah, I guess so. Huh? But you don't want to admit it, really. But wait a minute. Have we ever acted in such a way that Christ would be embarrassed? That we're behaving that way? That we're acting that way? That we're talking that way? I've had many times people say something and, 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 and I'll, I'll come around the corner, I'll be close, I'll say, Whoop. well, listen, it's not a matter of talking right in front of the preacher. Who was already there? Jesus was. He heard every word you said. It's not a matter of the pastor. It's a matter of am I, am I, am I being appropriate? Am I not being unseemly with Jesus Christ? He's the standard by which we go by. It's, I don't want to be embarrassing to him. So we're always appropriate. Weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice be appropriate for the situation. Then he says, if I'm going to see Jesus and people are going to see Jesus in me, notice what it says. It not behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own. It means it doesn't, de we don't desire our own pleasure, or our own profit. I'm, I'm never seeking something for me at the expense of somebody else. My way, my needs, my wants, I think, I feel, I don't understand, I think this is okay. My, 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 I, I, I. But if Christ is in me and Christ is in control of my life, I seek not my own. Paul said those things that were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. That, that, that if, if it's gaining for me, then I'm losing for Christ. You see, charity always seeks what is best for others. What's best for the other person? It's a matter of the two church members that walk out of church after a Sunday and one of the other church members is driving a brand new car. Oh, let's say they had a I don't think anybody here has one, but they had a brand new uh, Lexus SUV. They drive by them with the Lexus SUV, and one of them says, nobody ought to have a car like that. No Christian ought to have a car like that. The other one says, I think every Christian ought to have a car like that. Huh? You understand the difference? One is, one is, is, is 
seeking their own. What they're really saying is, I'm, I'm envious and I'm jealous that I don't have that car. Instead of being happy that that person has that car. The truth is, if you knew the payment they made on that car, you wouldn't want it. <laughs> Amen? But you know what? Be glad. Why don't we, why don't we learn to, to not seek our own? Not, not, not be after, oh, you've got to look out for number one. Let's see, where is that again? Did I miss that verse somewhere in the Bible? No, 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 no. That's conforming to the world, is it not? It's not a matter about looking out for number one, if, unless your number one is number one. <laughs> it's God. So it seeks not its own, and then notice also in verse 5, it says it's not easily provoked. You know what it means? It means you have a long fuse. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. My, my family just has tempers, just the way we are. Or Irish, you know, is not easily provoked. Well, I'm a redhead, is not easily provoked. It means you have a long fuse. Did you know when Jesus is in control, when Jesus is in control, it'll correct your sharp tongue? It'll correct your sharp tongue. It'll correct that short fuse. It'll correct those grievous words that stir up anger. They'll ignite the flame in somebody else. Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, listen, Jesus who just, just a few moments earlier, or a few hours maybe earlier, picked up a guy's ear who Peter had cut off and stuck it back on his head. Soldiers are have put a sack over his head and they're hitting him and with their fist and saying prophesy to us who hit you which one of us punched you they walk by and spit in his face they had people come up and lie about him they couldn't even get two witnesses to agree they just had to come and come lie and nobody could get their lies to agree but they kept working at it. And through all of that happened to him, Jesus answered not a word. In fact, so much so, Pilate marveled. He couldn't believe somebody could go through what he's going through and not retaliate and not open his mouth. Now he treat me that way. You're a bunch of liars. What are you talking about? He didn't do any of that. He answered him not a word. He was not easily provoked. The Bible says he could have called 12 legions of angels. The songwriter said 10,000. I think 12 legions are more than that, I think. But he could have called him and set him free. At any moment, he could have made those guys toast. You understand? A lady once came up to Billy Sunday tried to rationalize her angry outbursts. She tried to tell him, there's nothing wrong with losing my temper. I blow up and then it's all over. And Billy suddenly looked at her and said, so does a shotgun, but look at all the damage it leaves behind. True statement. Okay. One of the, you've heard me say this before, one of the, again, whether, whether we're conforming our thinking to the world or conforming our thinking to the Word of God, Somebody says, well, I've got to have anger management. That's anger, Galatians chapter 5, is a work of the flesh. What do you do with the works of the flesh? Manage them? No. You kill them. You put them to death. You do not allow them. When you go through the works of the flesh and you read about some of those works of the flesh, whether it's murder, whether it's adultery, whether it's uh, the, the other thing listed there, nobody says, well, I'm managing my murder. I, I'm in murder management classes. No, you say, you don't, don't murder people. Well, I'm managing my adulteries. No, you don't manage adulteries. You understand? We, we don't accept it in other areas 
of, of the works of the flesh, but somehow with that one, because of what the world has said about anger, we brought that into. And there's far too much psychology being taught in our pulpits and not enough Bible. And we need to get back to the Bible. Not easily provoked. And then lastly in verse 5, thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. You know what it means? It means you do not suspect evil in others. It means you're not suspicious of evil. It's amazing to me that Jesus chose the twelve and one was a devil. One he knew was going to betray him. His name was Judas Iscariot. But you know what's amazing? Jesus never treated him any differently than the other, tw- the other 11. There, there had to be no difference. They, they had such trust in this guy, they voted him to be treasurer. I mean, you look at that crowd that they had there, the fishermen, the tax collector, been a logical choice maybe. Nobody trusted him. Huh? The Simon the Zealot. He was zeal- a, a, relig- a, a, a political zealot probably. I mean, they had a, quite a hodgepodge of guys there. But what about one of the quiet guys who we don't hear much about? You know, Thaddeus or somebody like that, you know? No, they said, you know what? I think the guy to watch all our money will be Judas. I wonder if Jesus thought to himself, what are you thinking? Huh? I mean, but, but you understand? He did that because Jesus never made them think evil of him. Wow, do, could we learn from that? In fact, when he came to betray him in the garden, what did Jesus call Judas? Friend. Friend. A disposition to find fault with others is an evidence of evil thinking. A disposition to complain of ill treatment received from somebody else is an evidence of evil thinking. When you get into conversation with someone and, and, and no matter what you discuss, it always goes about where, where they start talking about how they were hurt or they're not treated right. Or they're not getting what they think they deserve. It's, it always goes to that. That's evidence of thinking evil. A disposition to complain about being neglected. People are who say, I'm, I'm overlooked. Nobody, nobody cares about me like they should. Thinking that they're not being treated like they, they should be treated. Thinking evil. People with evil thinking question the purity of other people's motives. Yeah, I know they did that, but I know why they did it. Hmm. Can I help you? No, you don't. No, you don't. Many times people scarcely believe that people really are what they say they are. They struggle. That's evil thinking. They kind of think that everybody but them are dishonest. Questioning the truthfulness of other people. A readiness to hear evil is a disposition to think evil. Sometimes somebody would never originate gossip, but they'll sure pass it along once they hear the story. Once they hear the evil report, they'll take it up and circulate it. Many think evil who don't speak evil. And a lot of times... They take great credit because they didn't speak the evil. But you're still thinking a great deal of evil. Can I remind you what the text says? Thinketh no evil. 
not just speaking it, but I, when, I, when Christ is going to be seen in me, I don't even think it. I, I'm just reading what it says. Everybody's looking at me like, You see, Jesus Christ reaches to the deepest recesses of our heart and it affects not just our speech, it affects our innermost thoughts. It affects how we think. The whole, the whole Reformers Unanimous program is to change the way you think. How do you change the way you think? You enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you allow him to permeate and his word to permeate every area of your life. And you know what? It gets down into the joints and the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. It goes deep and it changes the way you think. And when you change the way you think, you change the way you live. Then notice verse number 7 or I'm sorry, verse number 6, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It means it wishes evil to nobody. It wishes well to everyone. It means I'm not going to spread the faults of others. It means, uh, listen, is anybody here perfect? Anybody? I'll, I'll give you a minute. Why would we want to spread bad about somebody else? Why would we want to do that? It seems like we, we all like it. Hey, how many would say, hey, you know what? When I do something wrong, I really like it when somebody goes ahead and tells everybody else about it. I'll, I'll give you a minute. Anybody? No. So we like it when there's a cover or a veil put on our wrongs. But boy, we sure like to repeat everybody else's. Don't we? Love covereth a multitude of sins. What's a cover? Puts a lid on it, doesn't it? When there's something cooking on the stove and you don't want it to come out, splatter out, splatter over, what do you do? You put a cover on that thing. Never have done it, but I'm told that's what you do. You put a cover on it. When the woman was taken adultery in the very act, Jesus said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Now, the way I understand it, in that group of people there, there's only one person present that was without sin. And he didn't cast a stone, did he? He said, woman, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. She, she knew what he was saying. When, she, when Jesus asked her, have no man condemned thee? You know what she said? No man, Lord. Looking at him. She knew who the one was without sin was there. And that's why Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then number, number 7, verse number 7, number 9, I think if you're keeping score at home, it says, Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Bears all things means it puts up with injuries and attacks and insult. It's, sometimes we say, how are you bearing up under it? Are you bearing up okay? Believes all things. It means it always believes the best. Always believe the best. Hopes all things. It means it hopes for the best. Hope, again, is a sure, certain and sure belief. Hope in the Bible is not, oh, I hope, I hope, I cross my fingers, you know, carry a four-leaf clover, horseshoe, whatever it is, you know, I'm a... No, 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 no. It's not a wishful thing. Hope in the Bible is a certainty. When the Bible talks about the blessed hope and the glorious appearing, it's an absolute sure thing. We're hoping. Then endures all things. A firmness and a stability. That's what endurance is through it all, all things. Again, 
You can put Christ in all of those. Think about it. Christ suffers long and is kind. Christ envieth not. Christ vaunts not himself. Christ doesn't bathe himself unseemly. He's always appropriate. Christ seeks not his own. Christ is not easily provoked. Christ thinks no evil. Christ rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Because he is the truth. Now the question is, do others see Jesus in you? When the world looks at you, do they see Jesus? How often is our focus not on Jesus and Jesus being seen in our life? Our focus is on us. I'm not happy. I'm not treated right. I don't get, didn't get this. I didn't get that. I should be doing this. Why can't I have this? How come they have that? How come I don't have this? What's wrong with me? How come I'm not? And that's what our whole focus is. Where's Christ? Where's Jesus? Aren't we to be? Isn't he supposed to be living in us? I love the story of the little boy who's watching his dad shave like little boys are prone to do. He's watching his daddy shave and he's asked his dad a question. He said, Dad, how tall are you? Dad said, well, I think I'm six foot one. Little boy said, okay. He said, Dad, how tall am I? He said, well, son, I guess you're, you're probably about three foot six. Then the boy looked at his dad and said, Dad, how tall is Jesus? <laughs> he said, oh, son, we don't, we don't really know how tall Jesus is. Well, what do you think he is? Do you think he's as tall as you? And dad said, yeah. You know, you do with kids. You kind of just tell them something so they'll quit leave you alone. He said, I'm sorry, no kids in here, are there? And um, yeah, Jesus is probably as tall as I am. Boy thought for a minute. He said, Dad, then if Jesus lives in me, he'd stick out, wouldn't he? You know what, church? You know what, Christian? If Jesus lives in you, then he ought to stick out. When the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? When the world looks at me, what do they see? Do they see hope? Do they see love? Do they see charity? When the world looks at me, what do they see? Father, we bow before you now in prayer. And Lord, I pray that we as believers in Jesus Christ, those of us who have trusted him as our Savior, and according to your word, by faith, he dwells in our heart. He lives in us that he would be seen in us. That it would be not I, but Christ. And Father, today we have seen what it looks like, what our lives ought to look like, if Jesus is seen in us. Father, I pray you'd help us and you'd forgive us for being more self-centered than we are Christ-centered. For so often looking at ourselves instead of looking unto Jesus. And I pray today, this morning, that you've spoken to our hearts, that the, by the Spirit of God, each of us would be able to say, Make me like Jesus. May Jesus be seen in me. And with your power and with our yielding to the Holy Spirit of God, may you help us to be like Christ. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. But I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, I, there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner. 
And I knew I needed to be saved. I knew I needed a Savior or I would die and go to hell. But I knew Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day and ascended to heaven. And I knew if I called on the Lord Jesus and I trusted Him and what He's done for me, that He'd give me the gift of eternal life and I would be saved. And Pastor, I know there's a time when I called on Jesus and I trusted Him as my Savior. And I know that if I died this morning, I'd go to heaven. If that's your case, would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved today. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'm a Christian. All right, you may put it down. Anybody here today would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. When you talk about a time when I realized I was a sinner and realized I was on my way to hell and realized that Jesus died for me and he paid my sin debt for me and I could trust him as my Savior. Pastor, I, I don't really know what you're talking about. Well, I, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not call you out. I'll not embarrass you in any way, but I will pray for you. Would you slip your hand up right now and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? I'm not sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. Is there someone like that? Would say, Pastor, pray for me. Just put your hand up and put it back down. I'll see it. All right, the message was to believers today. Do others see Jesus in you? Yeah. Could we... Could we talk to the people you live with? Could we talk to the people you work with? Would we talk to your family members? Would we talk to other church members? When the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? And I wonder how many people here today would just say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart today. And the Spirit of God in me is telling me that I need to be like Jesus Christ. I see what it looks like, 1 Corinthians 13. I see what, that'll, what, what, the, what form that would take on. And I see I fall short in many areas. And here's what I'm asking you to do this morning. I'm asking you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit of God to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. To bring about these things in your life. It's not by your willpower. It's by His power. Oh, you have to want it. You have to desire it. And then ask the Holy Spirit to enable you to accomplish it. Ask Him to help you. He'll stamp His own image deep on your heart. Now, if the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning and you'll pray that prayer to God, would you slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor, the Lord spoke to my heart today. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. What a difference it will make in our lives. What a difference it will make in our homes. What a difference it would make in our community. What a difference it would make in our country. If the world would see Jesus Christ in believers. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. I pray that your will will be done now in this invitation. These who slip their hand up, Lord, I pray that they'll come and they'll bow the knee at the altar and say, take control of my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I pray, Lord, that we would live as, that we would allow you to live through us. That the life we now live in this flesh, we'd live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Help us to die to self and be alive unto Christ. Have your way in this invitation now. May you, I pray that each one will do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. Mm -hmm. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. She plays by the Bible, sing the invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond have to him this morning, will you please? Way, That's Lord. right. Have thine own way, right. thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way.
Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way. Own way, hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only, always living in me. Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts this morning. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us, who believe in Christ, who desires to mold us and shape us, that we be like Christ. Lord, help, uh, help each one today, each of us, to understand that's where the joy is. That's where the happiness is. That's where the, the, the delight of life is. That's where the... Uh, life and have it more abundantly is, is when we're like Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that we would live 1 Corinthians 13 and know that Jesus never fails. Charity never fails. Make us more like Christ because we were here this morning. Give us a good afternoon, Lord, and bring us back this evening for the evening services. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Remember, uh, pray this afternoon. They have a nursing home service, fifth Sunday, right? Nursing home service today, so pray for those folks as they minister there this afternoon. And then remember, uh, sign up down there to help on Saturday for this new church plant. That would be a real blessing to them, and I hope we can be a, a blessing to them. We're going to take care of your lunch and feed you good, so uh, come on, uh, help us out, all right? It'll really be a blessing. And then uh, the Tuesday night class, don't forget, sign up for that downstairs on that sign-up sheet, okay? And then, Lord willing, we'll see you this evening. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>